This year we have been studying those things found in God's Word that the Lord tells us is above all. In quarter number one, we did a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Ephesians. And our theme verses of that study was found in chapter 1 and verse number 20, which said, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. We exalted the name of Christ. In quarter number 2, uh, about February through April, or I'm sorry, from May to July, we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the wilderness wanderings of the nation of Israel from Egypt to the promised land were a picture of the Christian life and that God had exalted Israel above all nations. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse number 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. And we said, and then I say from August to question mark, is when we will have uh, quarter number three. And that is found here in Psalm 96, verse 4. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Will Durant said this, The greatest question of our time is not communism versus individualism. It is not Europe versus America. Not even East versus the West. It is whether man can bear to live without God. I like that. I agree. I believe that the major issue in the world is the existence of God. Many people in the world believe in God. A great many people even serve God. Yet sadly, their God is not the true and living God. With all of the religions and myths to choose from, I believe it's an honest question today. I've asked this question, how can we know which God is the true God? And can we know? And the answer to that most important question, I believe God has given us the answer. And that answer is found in His Word. The spiritual outlook of any individual is usually the result of the conception he has to God. Very often, a person has created a God in his own imagination. His ideas of God are, are gathered perhaps from parts of the Bible as well as from other sources, perhaps religion, perhaps a creed, a mother and father, a, a, even a tribal or geographical influence as to what they believe God is. Sigmund Freud, I don't quote him often. But he said that man created God, which of course is the reverse of what God's Word says, that God created man. Freud said in his book, The Future of an Illusion, that no man so desperately, or I should say that man so desperately needs security, and because he has such deep seated fears, and because he lives in such a threatening world in which he has little control over his circumstances, Freud said that man invented God to get him out of those predicaments when he needed something. He said that God was invented by man for three main reasons. Reason number one, that man fears the unpredictability, the impersonality, and the ruthlessness of nature. In other words, he sees disease and famine and, and disasters, and he knows that he hasn't got any defense against any of those things. So he postulates that somebody somewhere exists that can deliver him. The second thing that Freud said that caused man to invent God was that man is afraid because of his relationships to his fellow man. And because man so very often feels that he always gets a raw deal from everybody else, he wants to postulate a sort of divine umpire, a sort of cosmic God with a super whistle who can ultimately stop play and give everybody what they deserve, somebody who's going to make it right even if you haven't been getting it right along the way. Freud thirdly said that man has invented God because he's afraid of death and extinction. 
So he wants to find a heavenly father, a happy person somewhere who will take him to a happy place because he can't stand the fact that he would go out of existence altogether. And so he invented heaven. Now, I would rather disagree with Sigmund Freud. And I would pose the very opposite. I believe that man has not made God, but in fact, if man had his way, he would rather that God would not exist at all. See, I believe that if it were up to man, man would eliminate God. Well, that's what the Bible says. Over there in the book of Romans, chapter 1, and verse number 20, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. I can't wait to get to there. So that they are without excuse. Watch this. Because that when they knew God, there was a time where all of man knew the existence of God. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. We'll talk about man's foolish heart in relation to God in just a moment. Look on down to verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's the problem. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What we're going to find is, in fact, the Bible does not make any attempt to prove the existence of God. Because all men know in the depths of their heart that there is a God. Even atheists, you say, how so? If there was something that did not exist, why do they think that they need to base a religion upon denying him? So who is he? Who is this God? Who is the God that we claim to worship? In this series over the next weeks, months, not years, I've got other things I've got to get to, we will open the scriptures and learn from God's own words, the very person of God. And so as introduction this morning, we're going to answer this question, who is God? Who is God? I want you to see first... In the scripture, God is proven. God is proven. You say, well, where do you get that? Well, look at verse number one of our text. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. When you find out that he exists. Is that what it says? No. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen and his wonders among all people. One of, the, one of the most amazing things that I find in the scripture is that it never attempts to prove the existence of God. His existence is, if you will, taken for granted. The very first verse in the Bible does not attempt to prove God, right? Because it doesn't have to prove the existence of God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. I like it when people try to quote that. They'll say, in the beginning, God. Well, well, the rest of verse says, created the heaven and the earth. That's how we know the existence of God because of what we, we can see and what we can experience. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The very first verse in the scripture says, in the beginning, God. Moses does not try to prove the existence of God because he doesn't have to. As a matter of fact, his existence is so obvious that the Bible considers anyone a fool who does not believe in the existence of God. The Bible says in Psalm 14 and verse number one, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Well, how do they say that? Well, because they're corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. But I want you to notice the problem with people believing in God is a, not a mind problem. It is not a problem of evidence. The Bible says the fool is said in his heart. See, the heart is desperately wicked. 
and deceitful above all things who can know it. Do you remember what we just read over there in the book of Romans? The reason why people deny God is if the, God did not exist, they would not ultimately then be accountable to a creator. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, you see. He didn't say in his head. He said in his heart. He's rebelling against his heart. A thinking person understands that you cannot have <laughs> order from chaos. You can look around and simply see the order of things just like in your own life and realize somebody had to put all of that order together. Right? The reason why we have a watch that works today is because you have watch makers, right? It's not like that you can put a bunch of material in a, in a paper bag, shake it up for billions of years, and then all of a sudden a tag ewer comes out working perfectly. You don't get, I just wanted to throw in that I'm wearing a tag ewer today. That was a joke. It's used. Okay. You see. You don't get order out of chaos. Common sense tells you that. But that's the problem. People don't want to retain God in their knowledge, you see. So you say, well, pastor, what proof do we have? I want to give you, now remember, this is one message. There's a lot of things I can say, but I want to just mention a few things, highlight a few things. First of all, you say, well, well I don't believe the Bible. Well, it, it doesn't matter whether or not you believe the Bible. You're wrong not to believe the Bible. How about that? Right? This book that you hold in your hand is God's revelation of himself that no one in the history of mankind has ever proven otherwise. Although they have tried incessantly. You say, well, that's not really a good proof because I don't believe the Bible. Well, sooner or later, you're going to have to realize that you cannot discard the Bible that easily. Sooner or later. There are some stubborn facts that you have to face if you're an honest person. Just for example, as one proof, and then I've got to move on to other things. Take the, take the life of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. In Genesis chapter 3, it prophesied the birth of Jesus Christ 4,000 years before he ever was born in Bethlehem. In Isaiah 7, it prophesied that he would be born of a virgin 700 years in advance. His nationality, his family, and even the city of his birth were all foretold hundreds of years in advance before they happened. His agony and death on Calvary was prophesied hundreds of years in advance. As a matter of fact, Psalm 22, which was written in 1000 BC, gave the exact words that Jesus would say on the cross. If you take all of the prophecies about his life and death and then figure the statistical probability of them all coming to pass, do you know what the chances of that could ever be? The ch chances are about one out of, out of 10 to the 157th power. That's a 10 followed by 157 zeros. That we would just accidentally get those facts without someone prophesying them coming true. Isn't that something? Well, I'd say the, the Bible's a pretty reliable source. See, we have more statistical proof that the Bible is true than even the existence of George Washington. And God forbid anybody ever say he didn't exist. Isn't that something? <laughs> well, I've been to his house. Big deal. <laughs> right? They, they could have put a camel on that sarcophagus. You wouldn't know. I don't know why it'd be a camel, but you, you understand what I'm saying? The things that are standard for some truth is completely opposite when it comes to spiritual things. Right? All right. That's a scriptural proof. Let's talk about some other proofs. Go to Psalm 19. Nature. Nature in and of itself. You see the sunrise and the sunset. You see the moon. You see the stars. You see the order of this universe. When you wake up in the morning, the one thing that you can count on is that the earth will be beneath your feet and the heaven above you. That's what you know. That order that has come. Well, the Bible says that nature displays the glory of God. The Bible says over there in, in Psalm 19 in verse number 1 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now what we're going to find a little bit later about the person of God, uh, God is a trinity. He is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three. Did you know that God has given us, remember over there in Romans chapter 1 that we just read, the Bible says that nature reveals uh, the, the person of God, even his Godhead. The fact that he is three. Isn't it amazing how many threes that we even find in nature, don't we? Take the sun, for instance. It has three different types of rays, alpha, beta, and gamma. There are chemical rays, heat rays, and light rays, yet they're all from one sun. Take water. It can be a liquid, a frozen, a solid, or a vapor. The whole universe is laid out in threes. The universe has three parts, time, space, and matter. Time has past, present, and future. Space has length, breadth, and height. Matter has energy, motion, and phenomena. The whole universe shows forth the person of God. Nature. How about our conscience? How about our conscience? How is it that people that have never experienced the truth of God's word still have a moral code that they know some things are right and some things are wrong? Some things are good, some things are evil. If we came from apes, if we came from a lower life form, how all of a sudden did we develop some sort of moral conduct in our heart when no other creation does that? Well, that, well, that's God. The Bible says over there in Romans chapter 2 and verse number 15 this, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now isn't that something? Man knows instinctively in his heart that certain things are good and certain things are evil. Certain things are right, certain things are wrong. They, they, wrong, they, they punish those things that are wrong in those cultures no matter where they are. Why? Because the law of God is inherently written in their heart even in their fallen state. So who wrote the law in their heart in the first place? God did. How about life from life? That's another great evidence. What do you mean? Well look at Psalm 36 and verse number 9. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. If you look around today, there are no brand new life forms being formed. All life comes from a previous existing life. And since no one today can produce life without previous life, would it not stand to reason that life originally came from one all-powerful and all-living life? Without God, nothing, nothing makes sense. Evolution certainly doesn't make sense. The existence of God is the most logical thing that you could ever imagine. Anybody with any sense could know that there is an order and that, that there is a creator. He has all the answers. He can solve all the problems. He can meet every need. It is God who is the missing link that man keeps looking for that brings everything together and gives a meaning to your life in the first place. Who is God? Well, God has proven. Wish we could spend more time there, but we've got to go to something else. We've got a lot of guests here. I don't want them to never come back when I go past 1215. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're used to it, amen? You're a glutton for punishment. Who is God? God proven. I want you to see secondly that God is plural. God is plural. You say many gods? No. Not at all. Would you notice back in our text, excuse me, <clears throat> verse number four. <clears throat> for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods and the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Singular. 
Bring an offering and come into his court. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. It is very clear. If we're going to do a study of the person of God, we've got to understand who is God. He is plural. There is but one God. That's the first thing that we need to understand. How many gods are there? There is one. There is one God. There is one God. All other so-called gods, other than the God of the Bible, are idols and they're false gods. Men have given certain things or beings, real or imaginary, the homage that belongs to the one and only God, but that does not make such things God. The Bible says over there in the book of, of Isaiah chapter 44, in verse number 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and the Redeemer, the Lord of the hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, that I, uh, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it, and even ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. There's only one. There's only one. And any other God that is, uh, any other God that is worshipped as such is nothing but an idol. Men make gods, little g. They fashion them with their hands. Has it ever occurred to you the common sense that people uh, need to ignore that they're bowing down to the very things that they formed? How come they get power over them when they're the ones that had the power over them to make them? It doesn't make any sense, does it? If they were a God, should not they have just formed themselves? I figure that if it needs help from man to be formed, maybe it's not God. Y'all with me? The Bible says over there in Isaiah 44, as God looks around, he said, there's not any other God. There's only one. But we need to understand that the revelation from God's Word tells us that He is one, but that He is three persons. God then is a trinity. That means one in three, and three in one. 1 John 5, 7 says this, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I'm going to say this as respectfully as I possibly can. If you have a Bible in your hand right now that does not have that verse, or that has that verse in italics, or that has that verse in the footnotes that says that verse doesn't belong, you don't have a Bible. Well, and I mean that, and I'm serious, I mean that as respectfully as I can possibly say that. There are Bibles today that would deny that that verse ever exists, and it should be included in Scripture. That's right. Amen. Well, I'd say that's important, don't you? Amen. It reveals the person of God. Amen. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Count them. The Father, one. The Word, one. Two, the Holy Ghost, three. These three are one. Add them up. One plus one plus one. Guess what that equals? One. I went to public school. Matter of fact, Clayton County. But anyway, that's another story. Here, the math works. It doesn't work anywhere else. It works here. See, he isn't three separate gods like some accuse Christians of believing. There is only one triune God. The pagans who worshipped three gods did so because they knew from observing the creation that God must in some way be associated with the number three. The word Trinity is not found in the Word of God, but the word Godhead is that describes that doctrine of the Trinity. Godhead is found, well, wouldn't you know it, three times in the Scripture. Let me read one of them to you. They're in Colossians. For in Him, talking about Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's found three times in the Scripture to describe what we're talking about. That truth that God is plural, and the fact that He is one God but three persons... That truth is not something that was formulated in the New Testament. But that is a teaching that is all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. What do you mean? Well, for example, when, when God is creating, He's creating man. And what does He say in verse number 26 of Genesis chapter 1? And God, singular, said, let us. How about that? Make man in our image after our likeness. 
Isn't that wonderful that in Genesis chapter 1, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were having conversation between the three of them? Isn't that amazing? And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Over verse number 27 of Genesis. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Let's remember that because I'm going to bring all this together with how does this apply to me? God created man in his own image. That makes him different and special above all other of God's creation. And we'll talk about that momentarily. All throughout the scripture we find the three. Look, for example, at chapter 11. I'm sorry, look at chapter 3 and verse number 22 of Genesis. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. Us, plural. Look at uh, chapter 11 and verse number 5, the Tower of Babel there. And the Lord came down, Lord, singular, came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Verse 7, Go to, let us go down. This is not some new thing to make it fit so that Jesus could be worshipped as God. Since the very beginning of Scripture, we understand and know that God is one, yet three. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, now look at this, there's all three. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. There's three. How about Hebrews 9, 14? How much more shall the blood of Christ, there's God the Son, who through the eternal spirit, there's God the Holy Spirit, offer himself without spot to God, there's God the Father, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We could give you evidence after evidence after evidence. I'll give you 15 more. That's a joke. In Exodus, you'll find that there are three items in the tabernacle that are topped with a gold crown picturing the Godhead. The ark pictures God the Father in Exodus 25. The table pictures God the Son. The altar of incense pictures God the Holy Spirit. The, the Bible testifies that God is a trinity. In the New Testament, in, in Matthew 28, in verse number 19, the Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular name, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Isn't that something? And just so we're, we're clear about the person of God, the second member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, is equal and stands coexistent in eternity with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. There was never a time where Jesus was not fully, completely God. In John 1.1 1, 1 and 1.14 1, and 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, 1 John 5.7, Jesus is called the Word. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says this about the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Watch this. And the Word was God. We know this. Thomas referred to the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection as my Lord and my God, and Jesus didn't correct him. In Isaiah 9, 6, the great prophecy concerning this son that should come unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, this son that should come. His name is wonderful. Counselor, watch this though. The mighty God. Let's continue. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is God. Over there in John chapter 10 and verse number 30, Jesus testified, he said, I and my Father are one. The Jews took up stones to stone him to death. Why? Because they knew what he was saying. He made himself equal with God. He is one with the Father. And let me just throw this out there too. We've got a lot of doctrine we're trying to cover, but also make it very practical today. The Holy Ghost is also a member of the Godhead and just as much a person as the Father and the Son. He is not merely some sort of influence. He is a person in the Godhead. For example, I can only give you one for time's sake. Over there in the book of Acts chapter 5, when Ananias is, is lying about how much he sold his land for, right? He wants to be just like Joseph and Barnabas, you know. 
And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He's lying to a person. And to keep back part of the price of the land. Notice it is said about him, he's lying to the Holy Ghost. But look at the next verse. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Wait a minute. Verse number three said he lied to the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you know why? Because the Holy Ghost is God. Amen. And the Holy Ghost is as much God as the Father and the Son. Isn't that wonderful? The Holy Ghost is God. The Bible says, we don't have time, over there in, in Hebrews chapter 9, that He is eternal. The Holy Ghost is God because He has the power to give life. Over there in John uh, 3 and in John number 6, God's Word testifies that one thing we've got to understand before we begin to study His attributes over the next several weeks, that God is proven. The Bible does not have to prove the existence of God. And then I want you to see that God is plural. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. So what does all that have to do to us? I want you to see thirdly today, who is God? God is personal. God is personal. See, there's so many belief in perhaps the existence of God, but they believe that He cannot be known. See, our God, the God of the Bible, is personal. And the God of the Bible desires to have a personal relationship with His creation. We said earlier that man was created in the image of God. Now that's important. We said that there was only one God. All others are idols. God is a triune personality, one and three and three and one. But I want you to see now that God made man in his own image. And did you know that man is three in one and one in three? Man, because he is made in the image and likeness of God, is three parts, just like the God that made him. The image is like, well, we say not exactly like, but it's like the pattern of God. Remember, Genesis 1, let us, plural, make man in our own image. Everybody with me so far? So if God then is a Godhead, if He is a Trinity, then we would expect to find in the Bible that man bears a triune likeness to the God who created him. Do we find that? You better believe we do. Everybody, everybody with me? We're on our last point. You're almost done. Isn't this exciting? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right here we find it in many other places certainly, but this is the one that's so uh, obvious to us that you are also three. You are body, soul, and spirit. Man is a trinity. He is a spirit and a soul and a body. Are there three there? Well, there's three that are one and there's one that is three. One plus one plus one is one. Amen? Man made in the image of God is a triunity. What's the point? God created you like Him so that you could have something that nobody else in His creation has. And that is that intimate, personal relationship with the God that made you. Amen. See, God is not some floating cosmic battery cell that just gives life. God is a person. Albert Einstein said this, yes, we know there is a cosmic force in the universe, but he is unknowable. I want you to know that Einstein, he said, well, he's pretty smart. Well, they, they tell us that he's pretty smart. I mean, e equals, energy equals mass times the velocity of light squared. That sounds really smart. Has it really helped you in your life at all? I mean, man, I'm so glad somebody worked out that formula for me. That really helped me. All right, so let me just go there. Okay, great, he's smart, he's a genius. That's great. He's wrong about that. Even geniuses can be wrong from time to time. Even me. <laughs> God is a person. See, Personality comes from personality. You ever think about that? 
how could, for example, evolution know how to make an eye see, right, if there was never a such thing as sight before? How, how would we know words come together and make sentences if someone, right, was not the creator of language, you see? I know that, that you think that somehow, because you've been taught that, that, that whales in the ocean, the language that they've given are somehow equated to man. Where they go, that somehow, that's like conjugating verbs and reading books, right? But we are so duped. God, leave with that stuff, aren't we? <laughs> Did y'all like my impression of whales? Personality comes from personality. See, we are persons, and we have all those personal things that make up personhood, right? Well, that must come from a source that is equally personal, right? We know that God is personal from God's Word because it says, first of all, that He's a person. I, I, I didn't read, look at, look at this. Back to our theme text. Let's pick up in verse number Ten, say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. Only a person can do that. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge, that's personality, the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar in the fullness there. Let the field be joyful in all that is in the end. And then all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh. He cometh to what? Judge the earth, and he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. That's a personal God. Personal titles are described uh, or ascribed to him that describe his personality. What do we mean? He's called a father. Well, that's personal. He's called a shepherd. That's personal. He's called a friend. That's personal. He's called a counselor. That's personal. Those terms that are used to identify God are identifying him as a person. Everybody with me? And not only that, personal pronouns are used. Now I know in our culture today, we don't understand how pronouns are supposed to be used. I guess we can just use whatever pronouns we feel like today. This is not what this message is about. But for God, personal pronouns are used. The Bible always refers to God as He. He. Never it. God is a person. He is a person because he thinks, because he acts, because he feels, because he speaks, he communicates. That is a characteristic of personhood. All of the evidences of Scripture indicate that he is a person. And all the evidences of creation in our personhood indicates that we came from such a person. Amen. See, God is a living God. That's what you need to know today. And this is true of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. See, the Bible says that he loves and the Bible says that he wills. I love 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10 that says it this way. Here in his love, not that we love God, but watch this personality of God. He loved us. And he loved us so much, look what he did. He sent. Well, a person does that. A person who desires fellowship with his creation, who cares about their life, not only loves us, but see, love is proven, Right? Love is willing to lay your life down for something. He sent His Son to be the propitiation or to, to appease His wrath for our sins. Amen. That's why we need to get to know the God of heaven. Because He is a person who loves you. And He's a person who cares about your life. And He loved you so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. He has a will. Bible says over there in John chapter 6 and verse number 37, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. He has, a, he has a will, he has a purpose, he has a plan for your life. What's the point? The God of the Bible is not just a figure of wood or stone. He is not a carved image. He is not a planet like the sun. He is not the moon, he is not the stars, he is not the trees, and he is not the rocks. God is a person. And He is a person with whom you can speak. He is a person who can be worshipped. He is a person with whom you can walk and fellowship. 
You can know him just as personally as you can know any other person. Why? Because God is a person. Man, that's a marvelous thing about biblical Christianity. There's a lot of stuff that claims to be Christian that's not biblical. But when I talk about Christianity, I talk about biblical Christianity. What do we mean? We don't worship a creed. We don't worship a church. And we don't worship a man. We do not worship images or idols. We do not worship things that have to be made or things that have been invented or non-existent figments of our imagination. God is a person. He is proven, He is plural, and He is personal. And if you do not have a relationship with Him, you can get to know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life. See, the, the God of heaven, who is a person, created you as a person. And He knew your greatest need. And He met, and He's the only one that could, that greatest need. Would you bow your heads please and close your eyes?